Hey, what's up? Today, small bowel obstruction. Small bowel obstruction, a lot of information. It is not a complex topic, but it's a lot of personal management. So we're kind of going to start this one a little different. We're going to start with a case presentation, walk you through what I would do in that situation, and then kind of cover everything and you'll see why something is important versus why something is not. So 54 year old male walks into the hospital, throwing up for three or four days, has not passed gas or had a bowel movement. The last time he remembers eating something was three or four days ago and just hasn't felt like eating. He does not have a fever. The ER physician orders a CT scan and it shows an ileus versus small bowel obstruction. So they're calling me at 3 a.m. asking me what to do. That actually is very common. The only difference I would say is that sometimes it seems to be more women than men, but we'll go with a man this time. So I go talk to the patient and ask him any other questions. The most important question to ask is, are you having fever? Second question is, have you ever had surgery before? The main reason you're looking for a fever is because that turns it from a surgical issue to maybe a surgical urgency or it changes it from a surgical urgency to a surgical emergency depending on what kind of symptoms they have otherwise no fever you keep it moving the next step is going to be whether or not they've had previous surgery we know that if someone has had maybe a previous cholecystectomy or a previous sleeve gastrectomy like I did today, they're gonna to have less adhesions. But if they've had a gunshot wound to the abdomen and exploratory laparotomy, like I did today, they're gonna to have a lot of adhesions. So those patients are more likely to have an obstruction. So we talk to them, previous history, gunshot wound to the abdomen, exploratory laparotomy. Now I'm thinking that this patient is more likely to have a small bowel obstruction than ileus, okay? Really the only difference between a small bowel obstruction and an ileus is an ileus is a chemical reason or maybe your potassium is low or you have gastroenteritis. Something is just slowing the system down so it's not working. Patients sometimes present um, with DKA and they have an ileus, their bowels just stop working. If you have gastroenteritis, your bowels start work, stop working, but once you resolve the initial problem, like food poisoning or a little GI bug, your bowels start working again. And a lot of those patients suffer from diarrhea versus patients with small bowel obstructions don't have any bowel movements at all. So the next question I usually ask this patient is when's the last time you passed gas or when's the last time you had a bowel movement? If they pass gas, had bowel movement or diarrhea, then I know we're more likely dealing with an ileus. But if they haven't done any of that, then I'm saying, okay, this may be a small bowel obstruction. Now, small bowel obstruction, they're not passing gas, no bowel movements, no ileus. We say, okay, more than likely this patient has adhesions, no fever, it's not an emergency, place an NG tube, NG tube in the stomach. Once you put that NG tube in the stomach, we used to say less than 24 hours. So if you didn't pass gas or have a bowel movement in 24 hours, you required surgery. That's been stretched out now to about five days. So you can actually leave that NG tube in place from zero to five days and wait to pass gas or have a bowel movement. If they are really sick, they have bad congestive heart failure, if they have a history of an MI, COVID, something like that, you may want to wait a little longer. After five days, if they haven't had a bowel movement or passed gas, then you have to consider maybe doing an upper GI, but more than likely, most people would take you to the operating room. In the operating room, we're looking for adhesions. We take all those adhesions down then take them back to the floor or their bedroom. We call it the floor in medicine, but it's really their room. And then wait for them to pass gas, leave the NG tube in place, remove the NG tube when they start passing gas or have a bowel movement, give them clear liquids, and then they can go home. An ileus also develops after surgery. So we expect these patients to have a day or two of their intestines not working before they have a bowel movement. Clinically, we always say that the small bowel is the first thing to start working. The stomach is usually the second thing, and then the colon is usually the third. Sometimes it depends on what's going on. The colon is second, and the stomach is third. The air that you're passing is not air from food in your stomach. It is swallowed air. So if someone passes gas, you can say, hey, we know the tract is working from top to bottom. That's kind of a, 
a poor man's upper GI, asking them if they pass gas. If you ever have any questions and you don't want to do surgery, we then sometimes will do an upper GI with a small bowel follow through to see if there's a blockage. That's pretty much it. But we're gonna go over this stuff real quick because Chris Day spent all this time writing it. Now, small bowel obstruction, interruption of normal bowel flow, stuff is supposed to go from your stomach, your esophagus, mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, rectum, toilet. It can be functional, which is an ileus, which we talked about, versus mechanical small bowel obstruction, usually due to adhesions. Causes, number one, intraperitoneal adhesions from previous surgery. But cancer can do it, hernias can do it, inflammatory bowel disease, gallstones, gallstone fistulas. If you have a bad gallbladder, that'll cause you to have an ileus. Volvulus, twist of colon or any organ so that you can't get stuff out of it or in a susception where it actually goes, telescopes inside of itself to cause a blockage. Clinical presentation, again, colicky abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, not passing gas, abdominal distension, fever, that's the one you gotta watch out for. That means it's more than likely dead gut and it may be a surgical emergency, not something that you can watch with just doing an NG tube. Also hypotension, low blood pressure is another thing you need to watch out for. Now as far as risk, prior surgery, again all this stuff we talked about, foreign bodies can even block it believe it or not. You can either go up the bottom or you can swallow it and cause a blockage. If you have little kids, do not keep little magnets at your house. If they swallow one magnet, we're good, they'll pass it. If you swallow two magnets, they can stick together, cause a small bowel obstruction, and then you have to do surgery. That's also true for dogs, so don't do it. Any kind of intestinal inflammation can cause adhesions. About five to 10% of the population are born with adhesions, but there is a significant number of people that get hit by a door, get in a fight when they're young, real bad football injury, hit to the abdomen, stuff happens, and then they'll present with a small bowel obstruction later on in life will go in there and they'll have an adhesion pretty much right where they say they got hit. It's pretty cool. As far as diagnosis, again, usually it used to be upright, supine x-rays of the abdomen. Pretty much now, if you go to the emergency room, you're getting a CT scan of the abdomen and pelvis. With contrast is ideal. Without contrast, doesn't help us that much because the CT scan is a snapshot. So it may look like it's a obstruction versus if you give them contrast and stuff all goes all the way through, you're thinking more of an ileus. So you have to make sure that this is done with contrast, not without anatomy. Mouth, esophagus, stomach, small intestine, colon. We talked about it. The reason we put an NG tube in the stomach is because it prevents you from swallowing any more air, as well as this is the largest reservoir for fluid in your body. Your esophagus makes about a liter a day. Your stomach makes about a liter a day. Your colon makes about, I mean, your small intestine makes about a liter to two liters a day of fluid. Your body recycles it, but if there's a blockage, all of that can back up. If we don't suck it out of the stomach, that fluid can come out your mouth, go into your lungs, and you aspirate. So that's one reason that we put an NG tube in when you have a small bowel obstruction. The other reason is it decompresses the stomach and any other fluid that's backed up, so it allows your stomach or your intestines to reset. Once they reset, everything starts working, and then you're good to go. One little small thing for medical students, don't clamp an NG tube. When you think someone's passing gas or you're ready to remove it, do not clamp it. You place it in the bedside bag. If you clamp an NG tube, their body, their, their body will accumulate fluid if they're not ready, fill up the stomach, and all you're doing is stenting the GE junction so that that fluid can come up and go in their lungs. If you hook it to bedside bag, which is essentially means taking the catheter off, taking the canister off, putting it on the bed, or hooking it up to a Foley catheter, that allows that fluid to siphon off into the bag if it gets bloated. Now, management of small bowel obstruction. Again, IV fluids to make sure they're hydrated, no food, because if you start giving them ice chips at the same time, that changes the amount of NG tube output. Sometimes if you're putting out 200 every eight hours or 300 a shift, that's not a lot. But if they're putting out 600 a shift or 600 every 12 hours, you more than likely are not gonna remove that NG tube. It's hard to say if 300 of that is ice chips and 300 is NG content. So that's why we pretty much say NPO and the NG tube, talked about that. Now, non-operative water soluble contrast that sometimes will help if you have something you're trying to push through. We don't do that that often unless we're trying to avoid surgery. If you do serial abdominal exams, serial x-rays if you're worried about them, 
after a day or two with an NG tube and they don't pass gas. Most people about day one, day two will pass gas and feel better. That's when you pretty much know that you're out of the window. But once you get to that day five, you start worrying about it. If you're at day five, that's when you got to start considering surgery for two reasons. One, if they haven't eaten by day five, then you know there's a real problem that's not being resolved with NG tube. Now it could be your NG tube's in the wrong place, could be your NG tube is clogged, but you have to reassess. The other reason is they haven't eaten in five days. That's our spot for ketosis. So at five days, we start saying, hey, this patient may not have enough nutrition, so we gotta start doing something else. Now, if they have non-adhesive small bowel obstruction, you just treat the problem. So if their potassium is low, treat it. If they have Crohn's disease or inflammatory bowel disease, you, you just treat that. So steroids, flags, or whatever you need. If there's an infection, you treat that. Again, a CT scan is nice because you can get an ileus with a early appendicitis. So that CAT scan rules out some of the infectious causes. Now you can also get an ileus with pseudomembranous colitis, although those patients have diarrhea. But colitis patients can also have a ileus component that you also need to treat medically and not do surgery. Craziest thing I've ever not done was I had a patient that the ER called me and said, this patient has a massive small bowel obstruction and an early appendicitis. They haven't passed gas in three days. We need you to take them to the operating room. And I said, okay, let me get to a urinalysis just to make sure it's not a kidney stone or something like that. You don't need a urinalysis. This patient needs to go now. He's really sick. I said, okay, cool. We'll take him upstairs. Still wait for the UA. It took about an hour. They didn't send it in the emergency room. Anesthesia was ready to go back. They said, hey, let's take this guy back. He's sick. I was like, that's fine. I'm waiting on my UA. They were like, we don't need to wait. I'm like, no, I need to wait. Turns out he had pyelonephritis. So he had a very bad urinary tract infection. And he had so much inflammation in his kidneys that it was causing inflammation in his right lower quadrant and was giving him an ileus. So always stick to your guns sometimes. Now, if you are going to take this patient to the operating room, there are a couple reasons to do it. One, we talked about fevers, hypotension over here, ischemia, necrosis, perforation. That has always been an indication for surgery. As crazy as it sounds, it's now ischemia, necrosis, and maybe perforation. The weird part about it is if someone has diverticulitis, and we'll get into that later, that's perforated colon. We don't take those patients to the operating room. We treat them with antibiotics, let them cool down, and bring them to the operating room later. If someone has an ileus or a small bowel obstruction because of a perforated appendix, we treat those. If they have a perforated esophagus and it is a contained perforation, we treat those medically first and then operate on them if necessary at a later date. So perforation used to be an absolute. Now, because of laparoscopic surgery and CT scans, we probably have gotten rid of perforation, sort of. So a lot of patients don't go to the operating room straight because of a perforation. Even gastric ulcers, if they're contained perforation, they have free air, we just make sure it's contained, uh, protonics, and don't operate them. And those patients will have an ileus that will slowly resolve. The one thing that is always true is if somebody's getting worse and they have a partially surgical problem, they need surgery immediately. So if someone, no matter what you're doing here, if they start getting worse, then you gotta go to the operating room. Laparoscopic versus open management of adhesions is kind of different. 85% of the time, if you take someone to the operating room with a huge incision over their abdomen, you can complete your goal by doing it laparoscopically. Again, let me say that one more time. 85% of the time, most operations can be done laparoscopically. You don't need an open incision. The other nice part about laparoscopy versus an open incision is with laparoscopy, I can stick a camera in, look around, see what the problem is, and then say, okay, I can manage this non-operatively and don't do anything, and that patient has a five millimeter or 10 millimeter incision. With an open procedure, you've basically opened their abdomen. So nine times out of 10, you're not gonna close them back up in case you have to come back. So you're more likely to fix a problem that may or may not need surgery because you don't wanna do a repeat exploratory laparotomy. Now, when we start talking about, okay, adhesions go in and cut the adhesion, sometimes that's all it is, one adhesion and that's it. If you have multiple adhesions with laparoscopy, we will lyse the adhesions that are at the transition point. That's where it's a blockage and then it's normal downstream. And then that's it. With exploratory laparotomy, if they have extra adhesions, sometimes you have to take all of them down so you don't come back. 
The other tricky part is that laparoscopy, if you do a laparoscopic surgery on someone, your chance of causing adhesions, because remember they had a surgery that caused adhesions in the first place, is probably about 10%. It's not like adhesions everywhere. It's usually one or two single bands that you can cut that's causing an obstruction. With an open procedure, you're more likely to cause adhesions during that procedure. So an open procedure will cause another problem downstream versus a laparoscopic seizure. procedure is less likely. Also, upper abdominal surgery like stomach surgery or gallbladder surgeries are less likely to cause adhesions than pelvic surgery. So hysterectomies, common reason for people to get small bowel obstructions in the hospital. That's it. Small bowel obstruction. Questions? Let me know. Basically, at the end of the day, NG tube, decompress, doesn't work, surgery. When in doubt, cut it out. All right. Thanks. Take care.